All right, welcome everybody. My name is Greg Dattis. I'm a professor of history at San Diego State University and director of the Center for War and Society at SDSU. Uh, and I'm also a, a brand new and, and proud member of the board of directors for the Quincy Institute. And I want to thank you so very much for tuning in uh, this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. I'm um, looking forward to having a uh, an important and, and unfortunately relevant conversation uh, with Katie and, and Tommy and Travis today. Um, and uh, as an introduction to their phenomenon, what I want you to know. So I think it's important to, to start off first with uh, letting you know that the Quincy Institute's vision is the United States where it's easier to end a war than it is to start a war. And its mission statement aims to, as it says, move U.S. foreign policy away from endless war and toward vigorous diplomacy in the pursuit of international peace. And in many ways, what, what I want you to know answers the question of why that mission matters. Endless wars create an endless stream of veterans who oftentimes, as you see in this film, are, are left questioning whether their sacrifices mattered, whether their efforts led to something better. And here I'm, I'm kind of reminded of the British military theorist B.H. Liddell Hart's definition of strategy, in, in which he argued that good strategy should lead to a better state of peace. And what this amazingly powerful film puts into question is whether the U.S. wars of the last two decades ever came close to that goal. And so I wanted to do is, is share a few personal observations of the film before asking Tommy and Travis and, and Katie a few questions, and then we'll open it up to you all in the audience uh, to share your questions as well. And, and I think there are a number of important themes that emerge from what I want you to know that arguably many policymakers and most Americans are kind of uncomfortable discussing. First is that, that some veterans actually struggle with a sense of misplaced patriotism, with a disconnect between good intentions and the consequences of really bad policy. And what I was struck by the level of introspection in the film about how veterans were grappling with that and their wartime experiences. Most felt that, that blood and treasure had been wasted that they were following too closely in the footsteps of the Vietnam generation, and that the objectives assigned to them had been unachievable from the very beginning. And, and such questions should really make us, or such feelings should make us question our far too often unthinking consent for war-based foreign policies. The film also excels, I think, in showing how quickly presumed liberators become armed occupiers. Travis noted how his early intentions of protecting the vulnerable faded as this violent insurgency arose from within the civilian population. And as with their Vietnam era forebearers, American soldiers found it hard to believe the population wanted them there as this violence was just spiraling out of control. And, and for me, you know, the film, the film's jarring images of, of civilian children walking among these unrecognizable foreign soldiers who are layered in this protective gear suggested something was amiss in all of this. Next, I, I think there's something important for us to recognize here about this daily struggle to deal with the hopelessness of misguided wars of the immense challenges in keeping morale up when the vicissitudes of war make daily life seem like a crapshoot. Where was the next IED? Who was the enemy? Was a misguided house raid or killing an unarmed man who's simply changing a car tire actually creating more insurgents? Perhaps most fundamentally, what was the end game in all of this? And, and I think these difficult questions led to yet another theme, which was the relative ease which, with those who were interviewed in the film answered the question, was it worth it? And of course, I think it was hard to answer in the affirmative when the real question soldiers were asking as the film shares with us, what were we even doing there? And for me, I think perhaps the, the film is most sobering in its depiction of the tense and often deadly relationship between American soldiers and Iraqi and Afghan civilians. 
as one interviewee asked, how do we help them if we end up hating them and if they end up hating us? And as a historian, what I sensed here was something important for all of us to consider, that when fear is driving wartime relationships, civilians seem to suffer the most. And if there is a theme in America's approach to war, it is arguably that, that this disregard for civilian death has been with us for a long time. And oftentimes it's dusted aside with a sterile colloquialism of collateral damage. And, and here we get a sense of American exceptionalism. I, I would say even hubris that's peeking through. The film shares with us brutally, honestly, in my opinion, a sense of denigration towards ostensible allies. They weren't ready. They weren't competent. They weren't willing to accept risk. As in Vietnam, no wonder it was so difficult to become culturally conversant and empathetic, as one interviewee noted. So two final points before we bring in Tommy and Travis and Katie into the conversation. First, I, I was struck by the palpable sense of betrayal, of being lied to, of being sent overseas on a fraud, as one of them put it. As one vet argued, policymakers and senior military leaders have a responsibility at a minimum to tell the truth. And yet, arguably that low bar was never ever met. Moreover, participation in these wars left countries worse off than veterans found them when they got there. And that's a heavy, heavy burden to carry. As another stated, he has to carry his war for the rest of his life and for nothing. And again, I think we have to grapple with that, not just as policymakers or policy advisors, but as Americans. And finally, to me, I, I think it was a powerful gut punch to, to see veterans dealing with the moral injury of being associated with failure, of being forced to question their own morals and their own ethics when loyal interpreters, as just one example, were left behind in the countries they, in which they were serving, of participating, even if un, involuntarily, in a narrative of perpetual wartime progress and of, of having to ask the fundamental question, if it's not achievable, then what's the point of good intention? And we might ask why more Americans don't share in this injury, especially those who continue to cheerlead for war from the safety of the sidelines. And, and this may be one of the most powerful films because of all of this, about war I've seen in a really long time because it strips away so many of our facile assumptions about war. There is a tension here, I would argue, between the myths of heroic war narratives and a far more honest soldier, soldier testimonial than what you see in this film. And that to me is what, what I want you to know forces us to grapple with. And to me, it's the myth rather than honest testimonials that helps perpetuate these endless wars. And so for me, I think there's something universal here and I think it's this, how do we understand the costs of war if we don't listen to those who serve in them? So with that, um, I wanna open it up to Katie and Travis and Tommy, uh, the directors and the executive producers for this amazingly powerful film uh, with a fairly simple question, which is, why this film? What what was the genesis of it for you all? Thanks, Greg. Um, I think we probably should have interviewed you for the film. I feel like you've able been able to kind of capture everything we've you know tried to say in ninety minutes, basically in ten minutes. Um, but no, the uh, the genesis of the film really started. Travis and I worked at uh, an organization called the Home Base Program. Uh, in Boston, um, it's affiliated with the Mass General Hospital and the Red Sox Foundation. Really, it was a um, treatment center designed to uh, treat post-9-11 veterans dealing with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Uh, so Travis and I worked very uh, worked interpersonally with a lot of veterans coming in the door, um, trying to seek treatment. And we started hearing uh, the same stories over and over again. Um, 
you know, why, why don't people understand what's going on here? Um, I feel like I've come home and no one really seems to, to know what's happening in these wars. Uh, you know, uh, really kind of relating back to that, that mantra of like, you know, um, America's at war and its people are at the mall. Uh, it's sort of an afterthought for most folks. Um, so they're deploying, coming back, deploying, coming back, de deploying, and then coming back. Um, and really, um, you know, not seeing anything changing, not seeing people interested in these wars. It's just another thing that's sort of fallen off to the wayside. Uh, so Travis and I realized, you know, uh, really Travis uh, sort of had the idea of like, hey, let's make a film. We need to do something here. Um, you know, let's start interviewing veterans, really hearing from those boots on the ground perspectives of what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's what we wanted to do. Uh, we realized there were no films that really did this. Um, there's a lot of documentaries out there, but nothing that really just captured the raw um, on the ground uh, perception. So um, so that's really the, the how this film got started. Yeah, great. Thank you. Katie, yep. Travis, from your perspective. Um, why did we make the film? Uh, I made the film because Travis is my nephew and he and Tommy were looking for someone to help them make this film. And, you know, if you're outside the film industry, if you're outside that whole world, um, you can have the mindset that we have this idea. It hasn't been done before. It's really important. It's going to get picked up. You know, somebody's going to want to make this film. But that's that's not really how it works. If you just have two people with an idea that's really good and really important, but maybe it's not a popular idea, it's pretty hard to make that film. It's hard to find funding. You, you really, you are in the wilderness for several years, just making the film that you want to make. But I think that was what was so important to the three of us is that we didn't make any compromises on the film that we were trying to make. And we wanted to control it very tightly so that no one said to us, you know, that's that's really a harsh message. You know, are you, are, don't you want to have both sides represented? Don't you want to put some historians in your film? And then it would turn into something totally different. You know, this isn't uh, the typical documentary film that considers both sides very carefully and looks back on the history and gets experts to speak. This is a testimony project. This is a history project to get those oral histories down like as soon as possible, because they are so important. So, you know, then throw a pandemic in the middle of all of this. And it took us five years to make that film. But um, we finished it in the spring. And we're just very excited because we've had some a lot of interest. We're on the festival circuit right now. And we're doing our impact campaign. And, you know, I also want to say thank you to Andrew Basevich and to Laura Lumpy at the Quincy Institute for believing in the film and bringing it here tonight. And also Greg, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for facilitating this conversation. Thank you, it's my pleasure. And just as a side note before I'll, I'll let Travis talk, uh, we will be posting the link in the in the chat um, at, at the end of this session um, for everybody to be able to view. Travis, did you wanna talk a little bit about uh, from your perspective, why this film was needed? Yeah, not much to add. I think Tommy and Katie said it all. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the really interesting things, and I'm, I'm really grateful to Katie and Tommy about this is, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, there was a lot of anger, you know, a lot of anger at the powers that be. And, and I think at the beginning of the film, I, you know, wasn't thinking about or didn't really care, you know, kind of how political it came off. And I, and I think one of the one of the amazing things is I think we all came to realize, and, and I really credit them for this, is that you know, the message speaks for itself. And, and, and it's really, I think, arguably not political, right? And, and I think, you know, some folks might say, you know, this is, you know, explicitly or implicitly a political film, because look at the veterans they selected, but it was very important to us. And I know me and Tommy went through a lot of this. And I know, Greg, you're a vet, and you know, all veterans know this, right? You have these networks of veterans, and they, they span far and wide. And we had a lot of uh, vets that we served with and vets we were friends with that we still are with, right? That, um, weren't right for the film. And it was extremely important to us to be very open and honest about that. You know, we reached out to so many folks and, you know, we had, um, you know, the last thing in the world we wanted was a vet to uh, interview in the film and to say, you know, oh my God, you chopped up, you know, my message. I, I didn't mean it that way. And so, um, but, you know, that being said, 
Um, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. The statistic came out, it's in the film, I think it's Pew, uh, that the significant majority of OIF, OEF veterans don't think it was worth it. And, and you know, when, when that came out, we said, well, that's what we were talking about, you know, a few years ago and kind of why we felt like it was important to make it and kind of capture their story. So can, can I can I work off of that? Because how did you both and, and you as well, Katie, kind of deal with that question, both as filmmakers and as veterans grappling with that question? Was it worth it? Because you're, you're kind of looking at this, answering this question from a filmmaker perspective, but also from a veteran perspective. How did you all kind of grapple with that? Want to start, Katie? Um, yeah, Greg, could you clarify that a little bit? Do you mean, did we have a, a preconception of what we wanted people to say? No, I, I think more of, you know, from Tommy and Travis's perspective, how were they personally dealing with the, and themselves answering the question, was it worth it? And then how, as filmmakers, as you were kind of hearing veterans answer that question, incorporating the answers into the film? Got it. So, um, so I can say that in finding the 13 veterans who are in the film, uh, we talked to probably 40 veterans and we heard the same thing over and over and over again. And, you know, in the beginning, personally, I wasn't sure because I'm not a veteran, I'm outside that community. I wasn't really sure what the story was. And Travis and Tommy were, you know, it's not worth it. We got to get this message out. But Really? I didn't know. But then we talked to these 40 veterans and there were only one or two who who disagreed with that message. And the one or two who disagreed with that message, uh, one of them had a, a non-combat position. He was he was way back and he really enjoyed the war. And the other one was a combat medic who said that that was the most meaningful time in my life because I took care of my guys 24 seven, I kept them alive. And it's not my place to say to that veteran, well, what about the bigger perspective? But all of the other veterans that we talked to had that bigger perspective and they were asking questions. What were we doing there? Yeah, what were we doing there? Not only was it worth it because all of them were unanimous, no, it wasn't, but what were we doing there? So that had to be a central theme in the film. Yeah, I think I'll add too, just, um, you know, uh, being introspective about your time uh, during deployment and your time in combat is, it's not an easy thing to, to grasp and or sort of wrestle with. Um, I think Travis and I had the time, uh, we, you know, we had each other who we, you know, could talk to a lot. Um, we worked in an environment where this work was being done all the time. It was open and um, an objective, you know. Um, and I think the, the the part that isn't talked about a lot is that like war is very private. Um, you know, it's it's difficult to talk about your experiences, and it's 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 not an easy thing to come out and say, you know, this this time or my time was not used properly. Our, you know, our skills were wasted. Um, it, it, it's re really, really hard to explain. Um, but I feel like that the other aspect of it too is, is there's a certain um, machismo that comes with being in the military and uh, being in a combat arms role where there are a lot of folks who I know feel this way but will never be public with it um, because they want to continue that perception of who they were in the military at that time. Um, you know, and for a lot of those folks um, that come from very, you know, um, poor backgrounds or um, just broken homes and things like this, this was the pinnacle of their career, right? They, when they were 18 and they were a badass, you know, on deployment and, and uh, you know, slinging rounds down range. Um, that's the highlight. Uh, that will be the highlight of their life. Um, so it's hard to be objective about that too. It's hard to be critical of your time in uh, when you want to remember it in this sort of like sexy light. Um, you, you know, what I did was really worth it. And that's how I'm going to leave it. And I'm, and I'm never really going to think about it again. Um, so there's a lot, I think there's a lot of things happening there. I don't know, Travis, if you have anything to add in. 
Nice. I mean, you said it said uh, what I was going to say, and, and just echoing that. I mean, I think you know, I, I, all I could say is you know, for me, you know, this you kind of undergo this uh, this disconnect where you know, especially on my deployments, right, you're being told by chain of command who you know whether it's your uh, you know lieutenant captain on up through battalion and you feel like you know you know the people you're closer to maybe they don't believe it but everyone's kind of toeing the, toe the company line and and you have this disconnect um yeah i mean i very similar experience to tommy in terms of i know for a fact there's a lot of guys that i know and served with um that uh feel similarly to us but i completely respect you know the inability um you know or unwillingness it's com completely understand it uh, to do it everybody kind of comes to it in their own way i mean for me it was cathartic. I mean, I, I was the, uh, you know, I, I never really minded mixing. When I was in on my second tour, I was reading um, Fiasco by Tom Ricks and getting yelled at by my superiors for it, you know, and and so, but for me, it was always like, you know, uh, if we, if I can study this and speak truth to it and, and, and see that it's really not personal or isolating, right? This is just uh, unfortunately, you know, what history seems to show, you know, what we do, what the system does. Um, and that has been in, in addition to kind of making the film uh, cathartic and in kind of a strange way for me and, and helped me kind of deal with, um, you know, everything that the deployments and the service entailed for me and everybody around me um, and kind of, you know, come to terms with that, if that makes sense. <clears throat> No, it does make sense. So I, I want to ask a question for you, for you and Tommy, and then uh, one from Ernie Rosado, who, who has a question in the chat. And for those of you who are in the audience, feel free to um, post any questions you have in the chat, and I'll try to get them as best we can. So Tommy and Travis, from a, a veteran perspective, not necessarily from a, a filmmaker perspective, there is a thread in the film of this light bulb, bulb moment that we hear it a couple times in the film. I had this light bulb moment. For each of you, when was your personal light bulb moment when when you thought or, or in fact knew that something was amiss in your war? Yeah, uh, so I think it's um, it's kind of like this domino effect that really starts with one thing and then you're OK, well, that doesn't make sense. OK, well, this we're doing this. That really doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this um, in those that really starts to add up after a while. Um, but, you know, there are a few very specific circumstances that that happened that, um, you know, I just kind of went, wow, like this, uh, this really, really isn't worth it. Um, I'll tell a quick story where I was on patrol and I served in Afghanistan. I was in a place called Marja, Afghanistan. Um, and we were patrol, uh, you know, it was very heavy combat. Uh, we we're patrolling one day and um, we're in the middle of this big lush green field um, and we started taking fire and there was a tree line in the distance and then there was another field. There was an individual farming in that field and I had thought, okay, the, you know, what happens pretty, uh, pretty commonly is that someone will be spotting for the insurgency. They'll, you know, call in the Marines positions and then uh, the fighters will actually, you know, set an ambush or something like that. So I thought, okay, that's what this guy is doing. Um, he's either, he either has a radio, his gun is hidden in the field somewhere. Uh, let's bound up to him. Let's see what he's doing. I want to know, um, you know, so we spend, uh, you know, a few minutes kind of bounding through the field and, you know, we're dodging bullets and we finally reach this guy, the, the, uh, you know, the gunfire dies down. Um, and he's really standing in the field and, um, you know, with this big grin on his face. And I had my interpreter with me and I said, uh, you know, Maddie, ask this guy what he's doing here. I want to know, um, you know, where's his weapon? Where's his radio? Um, you know, who's he spotting for? Uh, so he said something to him uh, and the man said something back to him. And the interpreter tur turned to me and he said, uh, sir, he is high. And um, so I said, oh, yeah. Of, of course he is. He's literally standing in a field of poppy. This is this is his life. He's in a farming community. He's merely doing his job. He's just digging holes out. Um, and he just had the unfortunate luck to be born in an area that has been constantly, um, you know, bombarded and 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 seen war. Um, and I think that was really a wake up call for me. Um, that um, you know, really like what what are we doing here? Why am I, 
who am I fighting? Uh, what am I fighting for? Um, and, you know, if I had lost somebody during that small firefight, you know, how not worth it that would have been um, after just sort of hearing that response. Um, and there was a lot of those types of scenarios, but I'll let Travis, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe talk about his his time a little bit. All right, thanks, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, similarly, I mean, exactly the same time. There were so many. I mean, I, I remember my first tour when we got there, it had been, so I got there, I think, uh, September... October 2005 so we're talking like two and a half years after the initial push and and two years or a little more than two years since um you know the government fell and so we get there and we replaced um god I think it was like the 48th National Guard Brigade some National Guard Brigade out of Georgia and um you know at the time you know we come in and we're like you know, they were telling us like, we're not going, we don't go down these roads. We don't go down these roads. They had just lost a bunch of people. And we're thinking, oh, you're this shitty unit, you know, we're gung ho, we're going to go do all this. And so during the transition, this is like a week or two in, and I, I wasn't a, an NCO yet. So I didn't participate in the transition, the right, right seat rides, left seat rides, but our NCOs that went out, <clears throat> got blown up left and right vehicles blown in half. And we're just thinking like, what, what are we getting into here? And on our first mission, one of our first missions, we go out to the middle of nowhere by this joint patrol base. And we're just told we replace this unit. And we're just told they know not to drive down this canal road. So you've got like a hardball road uh, going, I think it was like going West or Southwest pavement. Then you've got a canal, then you've got a dirt road and you got a canal, you got a dirt road. And we're told without explanation, like they know not to drive down this road. And then it comes down and when a car would come down, you, know, you fire a warning shot. And then if it didn't immediately stop, you're just supposed to, you know, unload on this car, which, which people did a couple of times. And I remember, I remember doing it one time. And, and I think probably the only reason I missed is because the optic on the, um, the small uh, machine gun was not one I usually used. And so I, I must've come real close because the car just starts flying in reverse down this canal road. And, you know, at the immediate time at the right there at the immediate time, I'm thinking like, I did my job. That's great. I just, you know, but looking back very shortly in that deployment, then it started to happen. It's like, you know, similarly to, you know, your intelligence shop saying, you know, here are the insurgents. Oh man, these are, and you start to, it starts to compound and you start to see, you start to realize like everyone, people, people like dominoes, people in this unit deployment, everyone starts to realize I just want to try to get everybody home safe. This mission is lost. It was lost a long time ago. Nobody's going to admit that. But then, you know, as it kind of goes on, you realize the game that kind of everyone's playing. So, yeah, that was probably, that was kind of for me, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Katie, from a director standpoint, uh, Ernie Rosado asks, were you able or did you kind of compare your work as you were building the film um, to previous documentaries, like what a um, uh, Sir No Sir, the 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 uh, docudrama on Vietnam War protests within the military ranks, did did any other previous documentaries on veterans' experiences inform how you informed how you approached the film? Honestly, no. I approached the film uh, as a civilian, and I think this was a lot of my value to the, the actual construction of the film because I didn't know any of this stuff and I didn't want to know. I wanted to go in there as a blank slate and listen to what they were saying to me. And I wanted as a civilian to be able to say to them, I don't understand what you mean. Can you explain that? Can you, can you tell me why you think that way or why that happened? And you know, having in my mind another model, I think would have made constructing this film more difficult, this film, was so hard to put together because we are trying to make something coherent out of two wars over 20 years and 13 people talking about them. And, and so I, I had to look at this as a puzzle without an idea of how it was gonna be constructed because I think that would have made it more difficult. Yeah, there, there's an interesting, I mean, Travis mentioned that, that, that he wanted the film to have an apolitical message and it's it's really hard to do, right? Because war is clearly a political act, um, which, which complicates, I think, how um, the message unfolds here. 
Um, uh, uh, Greg, let me just let me just say one thing. I want to just I just want to make sure that I say this. I want to ask everyone who sees the film tonight to think about the courage that it takes for all of those veterans to speak so honestly and so candidly about their experiences and their thoughts. And a few of the veterans have spoken in public before, but most of those folks have not. And you know, for a few of them, their interview was very raw because they were talking about something that they hadn't really talked about before. And it just takes a tremendous amount of courage and also trust that we are gonna make a film that doesn't somehow exploit them. And so, you know, we were just so honored to work with all of them and to have that trust. Well, well Katie, this raises a really important question, I think for all of us, um, based on your experiences as veterans and then working on this film, how do you want Americans to talk to veterans? How do we get beyond the thank you for your service mindset and, and, and help kind of close that civil military gap which arguably is, is preventing us from having more informed and better conversations about policy that lead to these types of, of misbegotten wars. So as you're kind of building this film and, and now getting ready to kind of share it with the world, how do you want Americans to talk to veterans? Yeah, it's a really tough one. Um, I think there's, the one thing that makes us so difficult is that it is an all volunteer military, right? So there isn't an incentive for Americans to really care. Um, you know, less than 1% of the, the American population serves. Uh, most people will never, you, you know, uh, uh, there might be some sort of connection, but really the understanding just isn't there. And there's no incentive to really, uh, to really be motivated by that. Um, so, uh, you know, <laughs> public service is something that that I sort of um, you know, I tend to lean towards. I'm like, all right, well, maybe maybe we should do some sort of um, public service uh, requirement where okay, maybe you don't join the military, but you join uh, some sort of, you know, uh, Peace Corps or something similar like that, um, where you now have an incentive and every politician has an incentive uh, to do the right thing here because their sons and daughters could be uh, shipped overseas as well. And it really just isn't the case for a lot of them. Um, but I think that, you know, as uh, Danny mentions in the film, the sort of like pat uh, passive patriotism or passive citizenship, it's easy to, and, and Andrew Basevich writes about this in his book as well. It's easy to um, go to the ball game, have a beer, you know, 10% of proceeds of Bud Light is going to the Wounded Warrior Project. Everybody thinks they're doing their part. And in reality, you're we're just perpetuating this machine. Um, so I would say um, take an interest. Uh, you know, if for Veterans Day, I sent out a message where I work, like, be curious, you know, talk to a veteran, ask them about their time in. Um, you know, I feel too often these days, there's this perceived sensitivity around um, things which stifles curiosity and, and, and questioning things. Um, ask them about their time, the skills they learned, how it affected them and their family. How's their transition been uh, since they've returned? Um, you know, those, those are the questions that don't get asked. Uh, I think people are afraid to ask them sometimes. Um, and it's much easier to say, thank you for your service. Go on with your day and, um, you know, continue and just continue on. So that's uh, a difficult question to ask, but there, there are things you could do. Yeah. Thanks. Travis or Katie, anything? Yeah, I would uh, add, I mean, I, I feel confident I can speak for Tommy on this. One of our favorite books is um, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Uh, you know, I, when I saw the preview, I was like, no, I'm not seeing that movie. But uh, the book, uh, you know, it speaks to that, right? And and me and Tommy experienced this at, at, at the program we worked for. You know, we'd, we'd go to all these Red Sox games all the time. There was a partnership. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like there's, I'm butchering some old saying, but it's like you can't, you can't blame people for initial ignorance, right? But then when it becomes willful, it kind of turns a corner. So what I'm talking about is like, you know, we go to this Red Sox game or Patriots game and, you know, they bring out a veteran, right? And there's nothing against that veteran. They didn't do anything wrong, but it would be brand new National Guardsmen, right? Never deployed. 
And the whole, the way they would announce them, the whole stadium just be like, they're cheering for Audie Murphy. They're cheering for War Hero. And, and everyone was thinking that. And everyone was content with that. And it's kind of, you know, one of the things that I, I think we found was true for me, true for a lot of vets who worked us, is that the the intentional ignorance is kind of is kind of triggering, right? It's like I, from the perspective of so many people in the public, it's you know, part of it is kind of like you know, wary, you know, don't know what I'm supposed to ask or not. But it's also they feel like they are supposed to say, you know, ABC. They're supposed to tell you, like, you know, good job killing the bad guys, and and that's it. And I think Tommy hit the nail on the head, right? It's 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 being curious. We got this uh, question um, at a recent screening out here in Colorado, and it was great. It's a great question, right? And one of the things I've said is, you know, in my experience, not just me talking to other veterans, if someone goes up to them and, and genuinely asks, like you know, like I said, you know, what was it like or how are you doing if you're okay with me asking? Pe vets are so not used to getting those questions that people might be pleasantly surprised, I think, at um, at some of the answers, you know, and, and and again, it's just it's just letting go of assumptions and expectations. I'll just, last thing I'll say, I, I, this article I read uh, a few years back, um, it was the daughter, uh, it was either a colonel or a major who had been killed in action. And she was writing, I think it was in the times, I can't remember it, but it, she was writing about being at like a football game, like a Kansas city chiefs game around the time that the kneeling controversy is going on. And, and she was taught, she was addressing it to the nation basically saying like, you know, you're all outraged about kneeling, but when the national anthem's being sung, I see nobody's paying attention. People are on their phones or so it's like, again, it goes back to, you know, just leaving aside kind of the willful ignorance and being curious about it, being intellectually curious and respectful. And basically what Tommy said. Yeah. Yeah. Laura Lumpy asks in the in the chat uh, that you all kind of call in the film for American people to be better citizens, uh, to demand more of, of their elected representatives regarding decisions to send Americans to war. So Katie, for you, we, we've talked about this before, about your desire to to have this film be a, a tool for education. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit from your perspective um, how how we can do that, how this film helps um, do what, what Laura mentioned about um, uh, you know, serving as, as a tool for education and, and what you hope to achieve with that. Uh, Laura, thank you for that question, um, because that's a terrific question, because what we don't want to happen is that people see the film and they feel outraged, they care, they're upset, they want to do something, but there's really nothing for them to do. So they go home and then everything kind of trickles away and they, they remember that they saw the film, but then they go on to the next thing. And so we did not make this for entertainment. You know, when people see it, they're going to understand this is not a film that is meant to entertain you. So we want uh, we want to spark conversations about the wars because it seems like America really doesn't want to think about them because they're kind of embarrassing. We're a little shamed because we know they were failures. So let's just turn around and look at something else. Well, you know, what about... The, the civilians, the million Iraqi civilians who are killed. What about all of the veterans who keep having problems? So like, it's so important for us to, to not break something and then not even think about it. We have to talk about the consequences or it is gonna happen again. Um, in terms of education, one thing that's really important is to put a face to veterans, is to understand that veterans are not they, Veterans are us. Veterans are somebody's son. They're somebody's daughter. They're somebody's brother. They're somebody's mother or father. They're just people like us. And it, it for different circumstances, it would have been us. So, you know, when I was much younger, I thought about veterans as the old guys who marched in the Memorial Day parade. And I didn't think anything else about them because I didn't see any intersection at all. So that's another thing that we're hoping the film would do. In terms of uh, young people who were born after 2001 and after 2000, 2003, this is all history for them. They have no idea what happened. And you know, for, the lot, for a lot of them, it's not being taught in school. It's like this big black thing that they, they've heard about, but they know nothing about it. And they really want to know because it's recent history. So- right. uh, Relevant, unfortunately. 
extremely. So using the film as a tool in schools for discussion with these young people, I think is really important. And then for organizations that are trying to get the guardrails back on the process of taking our country to war. The authorizations for use of military force have not been repealed yet, you know, despite years and years of trying. So there are organizations that are trying to pressure Congress to get that done. And this film is a tool for them because it shows what happens when it's so easy for us to go to war that we don't have to fight. So, you know, and also it is, Greg, as you say, it is trying to educate people about our responsibilities as citizens. Because when we just don't think about it and we start waving the flag and that feels really good and we're angry because we were attacked so we need to go to war because somebody needs to pay, like that's not citizenship, that's childish and reactive. And what we get are these two wars. So, you know, right. that's and, and one more thing. That's been with us for a long time, right? This this desire to to seek revenge for what happened on 9-11 and to reconcile that with helping other people abroad and, and this tension between the simultaneous need to, to build as well as destroy it. It puts young soldiers and Marines in a, in a very difficult place. So Christine Jensen's got a really great question. Um, Tommy, you mentioned earlier that you eventually understood the mission was lost. And Christine asks, I'm curious what you thought the mission was. So for Tommy and Travis, I, it's a really great question. I'd be interested to see what your answer is. Yeah, for uh, for myself, I mean, um, I was deployed to Afghanistan. So I think the mission initially was, um, you know, what we talk about in the film was sort of half exporting democracy, bringing democracy to the folks of Afghanistan so that they have a say and they can start rebuilding their country. Um, creating infrastructure, um, you know, which was really just a farming community that farms poppy, which funds the insurgency, um, creating something else. You know what? One thing that isn't talked about is like, we did try to build a lot of that stuff. We built a lot of schools, which then ended up getting blown up, you know, by the insurgency. Um, so you, you are doing things to try to better um, better the communities that you're in. Um, but I think it's um, the overall mission really should have been Osama bin Laden plan uh, September 11th. Uh, we should have used strategic, uh, you know, uh, special operations forces to uh, go in, take him out. And that sh really should have been the end of it. Um, so the mission a lot of times for us was walk around uh, wait to get blown up or wait to get shot at, talk to the local populace, see what they need um, and, um, you know, try to help them, help them in whatever way is possible. And I think that's really uh, what start, what starts to make people think about it um, is we're literally just going around in circles here, um, you know, constantly doing the same thing. Um, you know, it's, it's really groundhog day once you deploy uh, every day, it's the same thing. You, you're getting blown up. Danny talks about it in the film. Uh, it's dri driving around, walking around, waiting to get blown up, knowing that you will get blown up at some point, um, and then trying to kind of pick up the pieces afterwards. Um, so I think that we we all sort of have these idealistic thoughts going into the war. Um, you know, nine eleven happened when I was a senior in high school, uh, so it was very easy to go, okay, well, I know what my next step is going to be. You know, if, if America is going to be part of this, uh, you know, part of this war. If we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, you know, retaliate against, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden and and uh, Al Qaeda, then you know, something that I wanted to be a part of. I didn't want to sit on the sidelines and watch it happen uh, from a television screen. Um, so I think that that plays a big part of it as well. Travis, do you have uh, you have an answer there? <laughs> yeah, I mean. You know, I I look back at uh, my naivete in that way, and I mean, it just you know, I mean, I, I think it it definitely started to change, you know, the first tour. But I think going in, and I talk a little bit about in the film, you know, I thought, okay, I know this is controversial, right? It, we're not clear if we're going to get weapons of mass destruction. Saddam's a really bad guy, right? They want us here, you know, and and then of course we were told, right? It's 
Um, you know, my first tour course was, like I said, two, two and a half years after national invasion. So we're told, okay, we have to secure this country. There has to be security before there can be democracy. Um, they held the first election in 2005. I remember um, doing like security and route security for it and everybody with, you know, the Iraqis passing by with the purple fingers. But then, you know, there was a, this big mortar attack and they were firing. More. And so, you know, I, I remember um, uh, officers, you know, up down saying, you know, y'all aren't privy to the real, you know, statistics. We captured this many mortars and this many insurgents. And, you know, to me, to those of us on the ground, I, I think it really just starts to just be a slightly different version of kind of like the body count in Vietnam. And it's, you know, um, you know, even if we could produce a, you know, safe enough Iraq uh, to, to host democracy, which we can't, right. how do we know why, why aren't we asking them or really looking at this? Is this the best system for this country? Right. I mean, it's just, but the mission we were told uh, was, um, you know, this is how we're going to do it. And then I know, we all talk about this in the film, right? The mission becomes everybody knows it, right? Just try to help get everybody back in one piece as best you can. Uh, and once that's the mission in a counterinsurgency, uh, you know, you've lost. So you've lost exactly, right? So uh, we're about out of time. So I think Christine Sheckler will have the last uh, question, and it really leads into one I was going to ask as well. Um, she asked, "Will the documentary be shared with organizations like USAID Alumni Association? Many USAID were embedded with." military in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, or World Affairs Council of America, which has a national network of 93 chapters. So Katie, can you maybe share as the last question, um, what's the best place for us to see the film? Where can we watch? How? We're, we're going to answer that question in a moment for the folks who are on the, the, um, on the Zoom right now by um, posting a link. But, but how can um, folks who are on now um, share with their friends and families how best to watch this film? So we are in the middle of what's called an impact campaign. So this is, like I said, this is not uh, an entertainment film. It's probably not going to get picked up by Netflix. It is going to be online uh, on platforms probably in the summer. Right now we're in our festival run, so we can't make it publicly available to everyone. But we're also doing these impact screenings. We're booking screenings at colleges, universities, um, peace groups, online screenings, like any organization that we can think of, we are reaching out to. But the difficulty is getting through to the right people. So, uh, you know, if anyone has any connections, if you go to our website, there's a contact form, you know, connect with us, help us understand who are these people that we need to talk to, to get this film out there where it's going to do some good. Well, uh, Katie, Tommy, Travis, uh, just on a personal note, th thank you for for making this. It's, it's as I mentioned, probably one of the most powerful films I, I've seen in, in such a long time. And, and the fact that it is a testimonial, I, I think, is important for us um, to kind of to grapple with the honesty, um, which I think ultimately and hopefully will have an impact on policy. I also want to thank uh, Laura Lumpy and, and, and Andy Basevich for uh, their continued support in um, getting these veteran voices out, um, because I do think they have policy impact and should have policy impact. And so I appreciate all the support that the Quincy Institute is, is providing us. So thank you all for coming tonight. Um, uh, we'll be placing the uh, link for the film in the chat, so please stand by. Um, and Adam, do you have anything else to share with the audience before we move in to the film itself. All right, I guess not. So uh, again, Katie, Travis, Tommy, thank you so much for this evening. I appreciate it. We're going to be putting the, um, uh, the link for the film in the chat. So thank you. Have a safe um, uh, and pleasant evening. And uh, please, please go watch the film. It's an important one. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all very much. Feel free to check out the website, sign up for the mailing list and stay in touch with us.